So this episode will explore religion and queerness, the struggle with coexistence, the ways religion affects queer people, and how queer people are navigating being religious or irreligious. Um, so we're just going to start with a quick introduction, your name, and just tell us one line of what you do. Okay, my name is Uya Edwig Peyton, and I'm a filmmaker. My name is Adu Aminu Aminu, and I'm a writer. My name is Remy Makende, I'm an advocate for human rights. My name is Nathan CJ, and I'm a culture writer as well. So, um, we're going to start off with what, how personal religion is for you. Like, are you religious? Are you irreligious? And what is religion to you? Nelson. Um, I'm currently just, um, I'd say agnostic right now, just okay. trying to figure out how exactly um, I'm trying to identify with God. So I'm just trying to figure, I'm just in the space where I'm trying to figure out mm. everything else as it regards religion. All right. And Remy? I'd like to think I'm very spiritual, I'm a Christian, and I go to church. Mm. Okay. Mm. Interesting. Um, I'm what I would call a cultural Muslim. Okay. I explained what that means in a piece I wrote for Pride mm -hmm. for Y Niger, which is essentially a Muslim who is in a space where I'm comfortable with whatever it is that embodies who I am. Mm. And I partake in everything that the Islamic culture has taught me and everything I've been part of throughout my life. So yeah. that's it. All right. Um, I'm currently irreligious, but um, I'm actively interested in African traditional religion mm. and spirituality. Amazing. And for each and every one of us, religion means something else. It's quite different. Um, but let's talk about your personal perspective, um, Nelson, when it comes to religion and how it engages queerness. Christianity, specifically speaking, as which is a religion that I'm pretty aware of. Yeah. It has has a pretty um, negative um, view mm. of, of queerness, you know, in real time. And um, I just feel like it's, it's, it takes a lot, in a way, for a queer person to still, you know, decide to be Christian. Mm. I mean, there are other things that come to play, you know, yeah. the, the personal experiences. Yes. The um, socialization, mm -hmm. you know, the person like, yeah, but do, do, I mean, but in general, I think that as it is right now, as it functions in Nigeria, since he isn't very healthy and or kind towards people. I mean, you're a Christian. Yes, do you I agree? agree? Uh, no, um, not quite. And okay. the reason is, I think I'm privileged to come from a family where. Everyone is very liberal. Uh, I think I come from a family where you're allowed to be who you are, practice what you you would prefer to practice. Uh, for instance, my grandmother is Anglican. Mm. My mom is from uh, P and S, mm. right? And for a very long time, my sister, who is my aunt, uh, attends Winners Chapel. And because I kind of grew up with her, she wants me to go to Winners Chapel as well. But then I went my own path and mm. I attend. Christ Embassy. And part of the things that you're taught in Christ Embassy is uh, love. So mm -hmm. the foundation of, you know, the essence of Christ, uh, Christ Embassy is love. It's believers' love world. Mm -hmm. And so I function from that perspective. I feel that um, you should know God for yourself, for okay. instance, and um, do not be burdened with things that you're not yet perfect with. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's my stuff. For you, you know the dynamics might be different it's your religion is quite different from christianity mm. would you still say that there is a safe space for queerness and islam to coexist so i'm going to uh, go back to the argument i raised in mm. that piece which is that within the mainstream islamic community yeah. there really isn't a space Okay. There isn't a safe space and there isn't a room for creating that safe space because mm. you wouldn't even have the conversation because there's a finality, so yeah. to speak, uh, to what you can or can't do. Yeah. Uh, and you, I'll go back to what the prophet said in his final pilgrimage, which is just before he died. Mm -hmm. It's like, 
Aliyom Akmal Tulakum Dinukum, which is essentially saying that today I've completed your religion. Mm. This was over 1,400 years ago. So whoever you speak to in the Islamic community, and I'm talking about the Islamic scholars themselves, they will tell you that there is a finality to Islam. So we cannot revisit things. We have to work with what has been passed down over the years. But I raise the point that in the larger world, there's always a safe space to be made for everyone. Yeah. So stronger secular structures that allow for Muslims like myself who decide this is how I want to approach my religion. This is how I want to live with Allah. And then I have the protection of the state because even if the larger Islamic community says we are going to exile you, we are going to kill you because you go against what the religion says, at least the larger world will give you the protection to practice how you want. Mm. So there really isn't, so to speak, some niches are being created now. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I tried to reach out to one NGO that is in Ghana, yeah. which tried to create a space within Islam, but then you have a larger and louder voice that has the backing of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, mm. Salafi Muslims, who are the largest portion, like the largest sect in Islam. So these smaller voices are drowned out. Yeah. So the larger world has to stand up and protect the smaller voices to practice as they please because ultimately the church is Allah. So we'll have to wait for the hereafter. All right. I mean, you're, you're irreligious, mm-hmm. but you have an interest in um, African religion, mm-hmm. which is no longer as practiced you know, as it was. Um, and that's to say that the bulk of the religion that we practice was imported. So how do you reconcile that? You know, you have this overview looking from the outside, so to speak. How do you reconcile religion, queerness, and our uh, Africanness, our Nigerianness? Um, so first of all, we know that religion is largely a cultural practice. Yes. Right? It's religion is every culture's understanding of God. Mm. And so in Nigeria, we've somehow let or allowed these other cultures sideline ours Mm. and bring their own cultures. And I very much identify with being Nigerian, right? And when I say that I'm very into spirituality, I I think that I rely a lot on my (laughs) ancestors for some kind of spiritual guidance. Mm. However, having said that, um, I struggled a lot in Christianity. And it's interesting that Remy spoke about love. And I don't think that I completely knew what love was as a Christian because I was judgmental of my own self. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine how judgmental I was of other people, right? Because I put myself on this pedestal, you know, the Holy Spirit lives in me. I shouldn't be doing this, doing that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and I don't think that I fully understood the concept of love yeah. as a Christian. And it wasn't until I gave it up that I feel like I actually started to love myself, mm-hmm. to love other people, and to not place myself and other people on a certain pedestal and expectation, right? And I now became more interested in my own culture yeah. and what, how my own culture defined religion and God. So I technically think of my own self as God, right? And I think of other people as God, Mm. right? So I meet people and I'm thinking about the God in them, the God in them that allows them to love, the God in them that allows them to express themselves in the way that they want to, within the confines of love, right? Because I don't think that anything that you do out of love can be bad or can be sinful. Amazing. Now, Nelson, you wrote a piece for New York Times, um, you know, about experiencing um, religion as a queer person. So I would like you to speak a little bit on that. It was, it was not the initial idea. Okay. I was really interested in finding a church that was, um, the initial idea of the piece was to just simply shine light on how, you know, um, queer, people, queer, queer um, churches in Nigeria uh, mm-hmm being more modern, uh, having more, you know, diverse contemporary conversations or integrating more, you know, interesting ways of being um, Christian and yeah. stuff. And, uh, you know, I was doing my research, I stumbled on a certain church 
Mm. And while well, I was before the main interview with the pastor, yeah. I, I heard really interesting things about the church. They said they were very open, they were very kind, mm. they were very you know, supportive of people of different backgrounds and everything yeah. like that. I was, I was really intrigued because they're really outspoken about that um, support and things like that. So yeah. I went there and I spoke to the pastor and it was a whole lot of different thing. You know, and it was really shocking because <clears throat> Pastor was even with within um, you know the privacy of his of, of his office, he was still you know homophobic. It was mm. and that was really shocking because you know we've created this church where people can come in with dreadlocks. You know, it's literally like a karaoke hangout every Sunday. I know, and that's very revolutionary if we think about it. Yes. It's very fun. It's very people can have genuine conversations. But then how genuine are those conversations? You know, mm-hmm. how honest are they if, as he said, he knows queer people who cannot outrightly completely be themselves in church. And that is just completely sad. Mm. Definitely really sad for me because I've realized that a lot of things that a lot of ways that we that Christianity is tailored and designed yeah. today is very heterosexual. It's mm. very cisgender. It does not allow space for any other idea or any other identity to come in. And that is highly problematic because, statistically speaking, a lot of people who are active in church who create, you know, church as we know it, yeah, of different backgrounds. They're women, they're men, they're queer people who dominate the choir, the creative team, mm. things that keep the church interesting and exciting and help us to deeply and understand God in different ways. So I think that the piece was really personal for mm. me, as someone who you know had is still just trying hard to find a church that is um, completely accepted. Mm. You know, I know it's going to be difficult because it's Nigeria, but I think, but it's not impossible because I feel like if judges understand that the crux, as Remy said, the crux of what it means to be Christian is love. That is super important. Like, if you do not understand that love, and as uh, obviously as I said, love functions from a place of acceptance, yes. of kindness, yeah. it will never do anything to hurt you. You know, or to intentionally keep you away from, you know, the, the main event or from being accepted. So, um, yeah, the point was just to shine a light on that event okay. and see how we can have conversations, honest conversations around how churches, um, if churches really, if modern churches are as, you know, modern Nigerian churches are as accepting as they claim to be. Yeah, that's it. Okay, you want to add something to that? Okay, so um, there are many things they the church does not address Mm -hmm. and i do not feel that the church can actually address every single issues that you know um people are faced with and maybe that is why we actually have the government and then we have the church and then we have other institutions (coughs) right so for instance um the pastor or pastors i don't see when they talk about people with disabilities i don't see how they say oh go preach to the blind like I mean, we all know where people who are blind could be, or we know where persons who have to use um, a wheelchair could mm. be, possibly. I don't see. I mean, there are some churches that don't even have the pathway for people with um, wheelchair, wheelchair, right? Mm. So I think that the church cannot possibly give you everything that you want. Okay. But I think you can find God for yourself. I mm. think you can find the Holy Spirit for yourself. And that's going to actually help you. Uh, guide you and help you handle a lot of situations that the church might not be capable of handling. So for what is important for me is that spirituality is very personal and yeah, so that's it. Okay, so um, first of all, the church has historically been a huge influencer of homophobia. Mm. The, like, the very idea of hating somebody senselessly for no reason except that it's because God hates the person, which is, you know, if you go by the Bible itself, is not possibly true. You know, the church has had a, has, has had a huge hand in, you know, inciting homophobia, homophobic yeah. violence. It's the reason why people are able to, you know, conversion therapy has ruined mm. so many lives, things like that. So it is, I feel like the church actually has a huge part to play in changing people's minds. It is very important that they begin to actually preach more love and more acceptance is extremely important because um, a huge part of our civilization as Nigerians 
is involved in one sort of religion or the other. We probably will by by chance or by but we at one point in our life will have to go to church. Yes. You know, or to the, or to the mosque. Mm-hmm. And we pick up a bunch of things from that tit. So for some of us we're able to break free. From others we just keep going in our cycle. Hmm. So um that first of all. Yeah. And then there is um I do believe that the idea of going to center spirituality itself. You know, the church is a the church is a place that helps to build the what the idea of God that you want to have. It's okay. where fellowship comes in. I, I mean be wrong on this, but I feel like it's it's just the idea of saying, okay, so if I decide to get an education, mm. you know, and I want to be homeschooled, I would do that, but I can't completely teach myself everything. I need guidance. Yeah. I may not have to go to a school, but I will probably need a teacher, right? Mm. So there is the foundational help that you get yes. that comes from, um, that is attached to maybe a church. You need, you need some spiritual guidance. You need friends who are Christians. You need a community of people who have your, your like minds help you grow and become better. I think that's what is at the center of, of churches being. Okay. Um, also, right, <laughs> Remy, I'm about to say that. You keep going back to God, right? And you're sort of absolving religion and the church of the blame that it's mm. supposed to get. Because what he was saying just now, the church is largely responsible for a lot of homophobia that we face in the world. Yes. So to keep saying God, none of us see God. And God has never, I don't know, spoken to me at least, or anybody else, <laughs> about homophobia <laughs> or about anything else, right? Everything that we know about God. No, not we, but everything that Christians or religious people know about God is what they learn in from their the institutions, church. from the church, mm. right? And you can even go back to the Bible. You must remember that it's a group of men who sat together and put those books together, mm-hmm. right? So you can still go back to that. Everything that you know is from these people. So it's almost impossible to now say, no God for yourself. You can't come to the church and... Um, without knowing God for yourself. Because we're coming there to learn. Mm. Are you now saying that because I don't know anything about I can't come here to learn? Mm. Because I must come here to learn. And these are the people that will now teach me about God. And what they teach me and how they tell me God feels about me. It's very mm. easy for me to take that and, and run with it yeah. and personalize that feeling. I mean, the reason you know of God in the first exactly. place is because someone told you exactly. about Exactly. Yeah? That idea that you cannot find God by yourself, you might not be able to find him by yourself. But mm. you you get to decide how you go on yeah. Yeah. with that thing that you have been given. Mm. You are given something. You didn't choose to get it. You yeah. just were given. So it's now your prerogative to decide, okay, how do I go on with this? Do I dump it? Do I define it mm. in a way that it's okay for me, which is yeah. what I do, which is what a lot of Muslim people do. Mm-hmm. So it, I think that option has to be there for people. We can't just say it away exactly I mean, or because it's, a, it's, a, it's, a exactly. it's a lottery system you know if you were born in a different household you probably wouldn't have the same path you know that you've had but i would like to ask you if you could change anything about maybe religion and how it sort of interacts with queerness what would you change so first of all the church has functioned as a political structure yes. and also I don't know what what kind of structure I should call this, but apart from being a political structure, the church has also had the responsibility to kind of shape the society yes. and not in a pol- political way is what I mean. Mm-hmm. I mean, for instance, a murderer could say, oh, I want to go for a confession in order to kind of read himself of the guilt. So apart from being a political structure, the church is also there to kind of guide and shape mm-hmm. um, the society. Yes. So, um, having this information now, um, when you ask me, am I religious or what religion do I practice? And I said Christianity. I mean that I practice the Christianity that is not of the political structure. Now, the church is very old and one of the um, highlights of civilization actually started with church, okay. right? Uh, but the church is not just a political structure. It's also there to, you know, guide you and show you the way. So yes, I might be privileged to grow up from with a family who is pro-choice, who believe you should be what you want to be. Yeah. And because of that I have I've had the liberty to 
pursue my own spirituality and yeah. to find God myself. And I believe that if you really want to find God, that you would find God. And so do not take away that from yourself. Do not say, I do not have the choice mm. to find God or I need X, Y, Z person to find mm. God. So now um, we have churches in Nigeria, right? We also have uh, spiritual groups that are focused on developing your sp your spirituality yeah. and not necessarily having a structure to say, oh, this is the church, I'm going to church. Mm. What they do is to focus on how you can find God for yourself. Okay. And that is what I mean by, if you if you can find people like this, you know, it would go a long way to giving you that choice that you think you do not have. Mm. I mean, religious groups, they help. They are in the minority right now, but maybe in the future, they could be mainstream. What is your vision of what an affirming faith looks like? So, an affirming faith would be void of any form of self-hate, mm. right? Any form of judgment to your own self. So you mm. accept yourself fully. I feel that until a person fully loves themselves yeah. and fully accepts themselves before they can extend that to others, right? So it would, it would be a group of people who genuinely mm -hmm. love each other, right? Who are not trying to obey a set of rules, right? A set of rules that has been preset by some man or whoever, and everyone has to keep those rules. Yeah. Otherwise you're going to be judged, you're going to hell. It would be affirming, it would be healthy, it would be accepting, right? You would, and, and when you talk about whatever problems you're going through, whatever conversations you have, they would be full conversations, right? You would not have any concerns that someone somewhere is judging you. Yeah. And I don't know if this is a dream, <laughs> if this is achievable, <laughs> but, <laughs> but this is how I think about it. That everyone mm -hmm. would just accept you every day that you come up with this new person because we're constantly being reborn and constantly changing. Mm -hmm. So if I come today and I'm like, oh, this is what I am now. Oh, we love you, right? Yeah. As long as you're not harming another person mm -hmm. and everything is out of the place of love, that would always be it for me. What does choosing yourself look like? Not having to choose between feeling constantly alienated mm. or self-harming, because that's essentially, those are the two options. You can either always feel alienated, in which case, like myself, you would now have to try to create new relationships, constantly moving, mm. constantly on the go. So, just not having to make that choice, being able to live with with the people that you love, with yeah. the people that you expect to love you. Yeah. That, that's just it for me. All right. And finally, I'd like to, you know, ask you, um, from journey from your journey to finding um Christianity, people fall off. From me from people's journey to finding religion, they fall off. I just want you to just gloss around the validity of it and how difficult both options seem, just staying to fight or just leaving? Um, I think that primarily it's a function of, first of all, privilege. If you're in a place where you're able to have the choice not to think about this too much, or you have the choice not to, it's not something that you worry about a lot yeah. of times. Everything happens quite you know, seamlessly for you. You're able to get your own space, you're able to decide where you want to go, what kind of, what kind of religious space you want to be in. And then just awareness as in knowing um, enough or not knowing enough. So um, the point of validity is people falling off Christianity or falling off a certain religion is valid, to be mm -hmm. honest. Because if I'm, I'm guessing if they had the option of perhaps knowing enough, they might not fall off. And that they fall off can also be a function of them knowing enough. Mm -hmm. Right, so I think primarily what I would say is just it's a function of privilege and awareness. It depends on where you are, you know, how much you know, how you're positioned, socially speaking, yeah. and you know, it's and it's also very personal to me. At the end of the day, it's extremely personal. It's, um, I, I would say that I consider religion to be a personal guide. You know, in my piece, I said that I, I, I still do believe in the idea of a being that is out there, and I do still believe that right now. You know, mm -hmm. so um, it just, I think religion is something more personalized. 
Yeah. You know, we just create something more personal with that being and it helps us navigate life and helps us guide and get through and everything. So um, it's just really personal, to be honest. All right. Thank you so much. Um, this was such an insightful conversation. I really wish I had more time to, you know, sail through this topic, but it was it was really insightful. And I feel like person struggling would be able to either connect or learn something new from what was said today. So thank you very much. And while we continue to have a conversation on how religion and queerness can coexist or not coexist, we need to remember that there are actually people with lived experiences going through this and be kinder, maybe. This is Untold Facts. My name is Kitty Mark.